Okay, let's get this show on the road. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here today. Uh, my name is Bill Cardalopoulos. I'm the series editor for the Best American Comics series, um, but I'm pleased to be here today with one of the best uh, cartoonists from New Zealand. Um, I I'm especially delighted that we have here with us today Dylan Horrocks. Uh, Dylan has not been to SPX since, was it 1998? Yeah. And he's here all the way from New Zealand. Dylan um, probably needs no introduction, and we're going to talk about the work, so I'm not going to go into an incredible amount of detail. Uh, but Dylan is the author of the classic graphic novel, Hicksville. Uh, more recently, Sam Zabel and the Magic Pen that came out last year from Fantagraphics and the forthcoming uh, Incomplete Works uh, from Alternative. Uh, Dylan's also produced a number of short pieces, as well as some really great um, historical and analytical work. He, uh, uh, we, it's very funny, actually, that we have uh, Dylan and Scott McLeod here this weekend, because I think Dylan wrote one of the best essays written about Scott McCloud's understanding comics, and it's one that I actually use all the time with my teaching. I just discussed it with my students on Wednesday at Parsons, right. uh, so we could talk about that maybe. But anyway, um, and, and, and the list goes on. Without any further ado, please join me in welcoming Dylan Horrocks here to SPX today. How are you doing? I'm, I'm really, really jet-lagged, so if I become utterly incoherent or fall over, just give me a nudge. I'm, I, I, it took 36 hours to fly here, and I got here about a um, day and a half ago. So, yeah. So, <laughs> um, come to New Zealand. It's a, <laughs> it's a beautiful country. It's a hell of a journey. Yeah, we should just bring everyone to New Zealand next time. Well, that would be really nice. I'd appreciate <laughs> that. Thank you. Um, as I mentioned, uh, your most recent book is uh, Sam Zabel and the Magic Pen. It, it just came out last year from Fantagraphics, and we'll talk about that uh, a little bit later in the hour. And your forthcoming book is called Incomplete Works, and this is a collection of short stories from a variety of sources. Um, I think the, the work of yours that most people, especially in the U.S., came to know first was the series Pickle, um, which I think, please correct me if I'm wrong, started as a self-published mini-comic. Yeah. Yeah. And then became a comic book series in, the, in 1993 from Black Eye, which doesn't exist anymore, but was a publisher in... Was it, were they in Montreal? I know uh, they were no. in Quebec. Well, initially, they, they ended up in Montreal, but it was a fellow called Michel Vrana, who's a wonderful designer. Um, and he started... He, initially, they started as a publishing company called Tragedy Strikes, which you know, was a fairly rash name to choose for a publishing company. And I think they lasted about a year. Um, before tragedy struck and the main financial backer pulled out and so then Michel set up on his own as Black Eye which was of course because he had a black eye from tragedy strikes um, and he, I mean uh, Pickle ran from 92 till about 97 um, and around 98 was when Michel finally succumbed to the inevitable that most small, small press comics publishers experienced especially in the 90s um, where I think he was just burnt out. He <laughs> was trying to make money publishing small press comics. Um, so Hicksville was one of the last things he published, was the book collection of the main story serialised in Pickle. Mm -hmm. But Michel, is, he's now one of Canada's leading book designers. I think he's a fantastic uh, book designer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, there, there was a number of there there are a number of different stories in various issues of Pickle, but I think it is the thing it is most identified with as being the place where Hicksville was serialized. Um, and um, has everyone here read Hicksville? Can you raise your hand if you've read Hicksville? I kind of it's sort of okay. So I'd say probably about half of the people in the room have read Hicksville. I think at a, at a at so the, no spoilers for the other half. <laughs> well, I have some spoilers here, <laughs> but um, just go no, la la la. I think. Um, I, I think one of the things about Hicksville, for those of you who haven't read it, read it, and, I'm, and maybe even this is a news perhaps to people who read it later, I think at the time, Hicksville, when it was being serialized in the 90s and then was collected as a book in 98, it was very somehow um, emblematic of the aspirations maybe that people had for comics. The story, like, how, would, how do you briefly describe what Hicksville is about when someone asks you to summarize? If oh, Jesus. Um. I guess Hicksville was partly about um, being in love with an art form which is marginal. It's on the absolute edge of the literary world and the art world. And the other story, which is what the New Zealand readers respond to, is that it was also about living in a country which is at the absolute bottom of the world and no one takes it seriously. 
Um, so it's about being at the margins, but instead of responding to that by going to the, the centre as other people perceive it, um, instead it's about staying exactly where you are and deciding that that is the centre of the world. And so in this case, comics becomes the centre of the world. And I create an imaginary town in which everyone is obsessed with comics. Um, and comics is what the entire life of the town revolves around. A um, little bit like being here for the weekend. I mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I think like the, the lighthouse in Hicksville is almost totemic for people who encountered the book maybe at a certain time because it represented a lot of aspirations. Um, it, with, one of the things that's funny um, about, you know, I mentioned teaching and using your work uh, in Hicksville is one of the nice things about teaching, of course, is you get to, you know, force students to read the books that you like as long as, you know, they're good and you can justify it and it fits you with your pedagogical plan and all that stuff. But um, I've always resisted teaching them Hicksville because one of the things about Hicksville is that it has such a mix of real history and invented history. Yeah. That, and many of them are getting so much information for the first time that I worry a lot that they would think that Dick Berger was a real figure or that Jack Kirby wrote tough guy comics and all this kind of stuff. I, I would know. love that. <laughs> if you started getting essays from people about, you know, that, that cited, mm -hmm. uh, cited Harvey Kurtzman's History of War as a, yeah. as a or, or Pablo Picasso's graphic novel, I, I would be so pleased. Yeah, I, lo I just I love mixing that. I mean, I did a story once about Captain Cook's comics. Captain mm -hmm. James Cook, who was an 18th century explorer, the first European to really map New Zealand. I did a comic about his little-known comics that he produced in the late 1700s. Before Topfer. <laughs> yeah, it was before Topfer. And honestly, I had so many people kind of like, wait, I didn't know about these, and I just I was so happy. <laughs> it was mm -hmm. great. Mm -hmm. But um, for, you know, for those of you who aren't from maybe familiar with it, one of the conceits of Hicksville is that this lighthouse that we were just looking at an image Spoiler. of. Spoiler. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This, I don't want to play up that culture. But OK. <laughs> um, the, the, li the lighthouse is a library, and the library sort of speaks to all of the kind of the broken heart of comics by imagining that actually Jack Kirby did do like his magnum opus free of commercial constraints and Harvey Kurtzman did a history of war and you know the real history of comics is full of all these you know compromises uh, the official history full of frustration of unrealized potential artists who never got to do their magnum opus but here it is in the Hicksville library the other history of comics the way it should have been with all the masterpieces um, and when this book was collected in 1998, and I think when you were here, that's when it debuted, right? Yeah, that's right. And it, that was like SPX. I launched it here. Well, yeah. not here because it was in a different hotel, but at this <laughs> festival. Yeah, but it was a very different festival. I think was Frank Miller there that year? Because yeah, it was like Frank Miller and Scott McCloud. And I remember Scott McCloud bringing, dragging Frank Miller over to our tiny little table, mm -hmm. and um, and saying, "Here's a book you need to have." And Frank Miller said, oh, OK, OK. And, <laughs> and then I got, about a month later, I got this email from Frank Miller saying, I loved your book. You know, I was like, can you give, can you give me a quote I can use in my marketing? So, oh, Art Spiegelman was, he? was here that year He also. didn't come by my table. <laughs> I'm seeing him in Columbus in a few weeks. So. Um, sort him out. Yeah, and one of the things I'm kind of wondering, like this book was originally collected in 98 by Black Eye, then Black, as you mentioned, Black Eye stopped, and D, Drawn and Quarterly picked it up, and they very recently, I guess, maybe two years ago, put out a new edition, maybe. Five years ago, it was five, 2010, oh, yeah. Time goes by so I fast. I know. Um, I still think of this as very new. Um, but I, I, I kind of wonder about the book, especially even like for the people who are younger and coming to SPX now, because at that time, <laughs> there were a couple of things about Hicksville. The one is that I felt like at that time that it came out, there was a common sense of reference points. Hmm. You know, like you could just sort of assume that everyone had read like the Smithsonian Book of Comic Book Comics, and, you know, and had like, you know, was sort of at least invested in the idea of Harvey Kurtzman and that everyone had read, you know, some of these basic things and that everyone also had been marginal for so long and had this kind of shared sense of aspiration of, oh, graphic novels and more serious narratives and more poetic narratives and this and that and the other thing. So I feel like the book kind of speaks to all those ambitions. Now, I wonder if maybe um, someone who's you know, more recently participating in comics for the first time would look at this and feel like it's, um, well, we already live in that world. Like, I can make any comic I want, and I go to the, gra the library or the bookstore, and there's a graphic novel section, and this and that and the other thing. I mean, yeah. what do you think about the position of Hicksville today? It's, it's hard for me to say. I, it's, um, 
certainly the world of comics has changed unimaginably uh, from 1998. Uh, I mean, coming to this small press expo, this is the first time I've been here since the one where we launched Hicks Hill, and it feels like um, not just a bigger festival, I mean, it's a significantly bigger festival, but a completely different festival. There's a, you know, there's a few friends here in the audience who were here with me in 98, um, and so we're still around, but there's a whole other world of comics has kind of just emerged, emerged around us, which, is, which feels quite, it feels quite detached from the, the world that we were in in 98. It's like, a, it's like a different world of comics has emerged. And it's actually a really exciting, beautiful world. It's, it's, there's so many extraordinary things happening in comics right now, and so many people making comics and reading comics who, who wouldn't have been interested in 1998, you know? It was a different scene. And the, in Hicksville, the very last image in Hicksville, which very few people talk about, actually. I mean, everyone talks about the scene in the library in the, in the lighthouse. That's those original pages sold, like, in, in a week when it came out. But, um, but the final image of the book is of... Because uh, the, the, the islands of New Zealand have come adrift and they're just floating through the ocean. In this, this is in this little sub-story, a comic that they keep finding pages of. And the island is drifting and they don't know where they are anymore. But the, the, the three characters are standing on top of a lighthouse looking out as if it was a crow's nest on a ship. And they see land. They see land coming towards them across the sea, and they're approaching a new shore, and they don't know what it is. It's like a new land they've never seen before. I feel like that's what's happening with comics. You know, there's this this whole new continent that we've just discovered, or that that's just sort of emerged out of the mist as we sail through the waters of comics, and and I'm so excited, you know, to explore it because it's um, fresh. To, it's 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 a totally fresh landscape, and. Mm. Uh, yeah, so I I don't know how young people read Hicksville these right. days. I right. you know I, it's um. I guess it's of its time, but I also feel like um, I mean I've. I've had a lot of response, from novelists who read. I've got a lot of friends in New Zealand who are writers, because um, they after Hicksville came out, I started getting invited to literary festivals because there were a few particular New Zealand novelists who really took to the book. Um, and so I, I would hang out with all these novelists, and they responded to Hicksville as a story about the, the difficulties and the complexities of loving any art form, of, of being, creating stories and worlds, and, um, and all the compromises and difficulties involved in that. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't know, maybe people r will read it as a different kind of story mm -hmm. these days. I do, I actually do still think of Hicksville as aspirational in some ways. Um, like, you know, I was rereading it recently knowing that we were gonna talk. Um, you know, I read it very quickly, but uh, you know, I'd read it a few times before. And one of the things that I really loved so much about it was that um, just those kind of moments where you're reminded that everyone in the town reads comics and has like some particular little thing that they're into like the mailman likes mini comics because they're they go through the mail usually you know everyone <laughs> every, you know everyone's got their little thing and to me that was such a tonic because um, in many ways it feels like things that come from comic book culture have saturated the world I mean I can't walk down mm -hmm. the street without seeing a poster for Ant-Man or, or someone wearing a t-shirt with a you know, Batman logo on it or something like that. Yet, it's like, most of them aren't actually reading comics, you know? Yeah, <laughs> and, no, that's absolutely true. And, and I, I mean, people uh, are always asking me, because, uh, you know, superhero comics, the, when you look at the sales figures for superhero comics and their history, in the 1940s and 50s, they're like, here, you know, and then they, they just kind of go like this. And the sales are going down and down and down with these little blips. But overall, they just keep going down and down and down. And people are always saying, but surely all the superhero movies have changed that. And, but as far as I can tell, not really, no. <laughs> the, what's happened is that the genre has migrated to a different medium. Mm -hmm. but, um, but the old medium is, is, in, is just, as, just as kind of ignored. I mean, you go to San Diego. I mean, not that I've, uh, last time I went to San Diego was 2001. And even then, it was starting to feel like it wasn't really a comics show. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. 
Um, one, of, one of the other things about Hicksville that I think, you know, I think there, you know, there are a couple of things, and there, well, there are a lot of things in Hicksville. One is this, you know, the, the love of comics, I think, just feels like the, the motivator behind, like, your whole c career, but it's also very explicitly a comic about <coughs> comics. Um, but there's also one of the other things in Hicksville that struck me as being really connected to some of the other work that you've done is that um, so much in it is predicated on a kind of artistic crisis. You know, we see the <laughs> Sam Zabel character, and he's kind of at, at loose ends, trying to figure out what he's doing. And then the real, the, the sort of nominal mystery of Hicksville is what did Dick Berger do, and what is the story there? And that was a character who couldn't, couldn't quite face himself to get it together to make an artistic statement mm -hmm. and ended up stealing it's someone, artistic crisis someone else's story. The, yeah. um, and, um, you know, Sam Zabel, which we'll talk about in a little bit in The Magic Pen, kind of starts out that way. And it seemed like this went back to a story um, even before, I think this is from before Hicksville, mm -hmm. called The Last Fox Story. Right, this is, is it's 1990. This 1990, is, uh, yeah. That's how old I am. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit? Of, I don't have yeah, the yeah, entire story. I have like a couple of sli representative really, slides. <laughs> but can you talk a little bit about what this story is? Because you've talked yeah. about it as an important story for you. Yeah, I, this, this story was, um, I went to England when I was in my early 20s. And this is because yeah, I lived This in, is something that I think a lot of people from New Zealand do, right? Exactly. Uh -huh. We call it the big OE or the big overseas experience. Mm -hmm. and. Um, and I, but I went to New Zealand because I, I knew I wanted to be a cartoonist and there was no way to be a cartoonist in New Zealand. We had no comics industry, there were no publishers. Um, so what people did, because there was a, a predecessor, there was a, is a guy called Colin Wilson who is a New Zealander who started a wonderful comics magazine called Strips. And then he, which you know, was just a totally amateur thing, but beautifully done, beautiful comics. And then he moved to England and he got a job drawing for 2000 AD and then from there he went to Europe and in the end he was drawing comics with Moebius, Jean Giraud. He was doing um, Lieutenant Blueberry comics, which was kind of his idol, so he, he really achieved his dream. And so I looked at that and thought, well that's what I have to do, is go to Europe. So I went to England and um, assumed I would you know, go and get work f drawing comics and, and then from there I moved to Europe and so on. Um, of course, you know, I, I was never going to be hired by 2080. I had no idea what I was doing. And uh, so I ended up working in a bookshop and trying so hard to work on my comics, but all this pressure was involved now. You know, and now I was trying to make it a career. I wasn't just drawing comics, I was trying to build a career. And, uh, and as a result, I just completely dried up. I, I, um, I slowed, my work slowed down, I stopped producing stuff. And one day I, I went into a comic shop and basically had a panic attack. I just completely freaked out. I felt nauseous and dizzy. Um, I couldn't look at comics and so I fled. And I tried a few other experiments. I went home and I, I um, for the first time in months, you know, I pulled out this comic that I had s supposedly been drawing and I just felt sick, I couldn't look at it. And what I discovered is that I developed like a phobia of comics, a deep fear of comics, and I couldn't deal with them anymore. Um, and that lasted for quite some time until finally I, I tricked myself into drawing a comic about it. And the way I did it is I, I just wrote in my notebook a long story about it, uh, just, just with words. And then when I was at work, I worked in a children's bookshop at the time. And when I was at work and I had five minutes between customers, I'd just pull out a little notepad, a little memo pad, and with a ballpoint pen, I'd just draw drawings that were in some way connected with the story. And then after a month or so, I took everything I had and I put it together into a little booklet. And so it looks almost like a children's picture book. It's, it's a series of... Um, double page spreads with words and then a picture. And, and it, it's sort of, you know, I, I could fool myself into thinking I wasn't drawing a comic, but really it is a comic, and it's a comic about finding my way back to comics. So by the time I'd finished it, I felt like I could, I could deal with comics again, and I started producing more mini-comics. Mm -hmm. 
That's so interesting in so many ways. I mean, there, there is the, you know, the whole question of like, what do you, you know, what motivates you to make art beyond love of the form, the question of deciding what to say. One of the things that's interesting to me about this too, um, and I actually Scott McLeod is here in the audience, and we mentioned Scott before. You know, I think uh, one of the things that's, I, you know, I love discussions of comics form. I love comics that are experimental. Um, I mean, I love a lot of different kinds of comics. Um, it's part of my job. Um, but uh, I, um, but I, what I always find is that, you know, I think some people feel alienated by work that's experimental because on the surface it can seem sort of abstruse or something like that. But to me, when it works, it's so great because what it does is it opens up a whole other realm of possibilities. And I think sometimes you have to like trick yourself out of the conventions because the, the, comics do get wrapped up in conventions, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, not these, well, comic book conventions too, but, um, you know, like the conventions <laughs> of the form, the conventions of the form, you know, the, the well, you got to rule out your page this way and your text needs to be contained in a balloon and yeah. things like that. And it's always, I, it's always very refreshing um, even to think of things from outside of the comics field as comics, like series of paintings and the kind of stuff stop, Scott was talking about in Understanding Comics. Yeah, totally. And you've talked about things like this too in your essay about Understanding Comics, talking yeah. about series of paintings as comics and things like that. Yeah, I, um, I actually think it's really interesting that with the new explosion of comics that's emerging, I feel like a lot of those are being produced by people who haven't grown up obsessively just looking at comics. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that, that there are a lot of comics. Well, I don't know, maybe, maybe there's new conventions emerging now that are really grouped around the graphic novel. Uh, and I, you know, when I, I'm in the library, our public library in Auckland is, is amazing on graphic novels. There's a, a whole bunch of cartoonists who work there, and so they always have the best, most wonderful, obscure things. But when I look at the graphic novels at the public library, I'm often struck by how samey some of them are starting to look. Yeah. I don't know if I should say this, but, 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 but maybe, like I feel like there was an explosion several years ago of completely new kinds of comics, even maybe going back to the late 90s with Fort Thunder and um, it felt like there was a group of people coming to comics as a form of art rather than purely as a kind of narrative form. And um, people like Ben Jones and so on. And, and it, it meant that you got a completely different feel and all the conventions had disappeared in a lot of them. And, uh, but maybe that was a transitional phase and now there's a new so, uh, this is going to be a big distraction to the conversation. Well, yeah, I mean, I could actually talk about that a lot because my, yeah. the, but I don't want to derail this, but just to, to what you said, I think what happened is that um, I think that strain that you're identifying of people doing art comics is with, with more art school kind of influences, to put it like in a simple way. Well, like the, the stuff I'm thinking of came, came out of the, the kind of art school refugees. Or art school dropout influence, you yeah. know, and they, and they like were, and that they were, experience. They were using yeah. comics as a way to, to escape from the constraints that art school... Oh, totally, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. But actually, to do their most interesting art. Yeah. But, but it's, it's the emphasis on comics as a kind of... Like, narrative was part of the palette they would deploy. Right, in but not always the one in the Rather than being foreground. necessarily the purpose of it. Right, right, um, right. But I think the graphic novel has, has really foregrounded narrative exactly. again, and yeah. in a different way. Well, I think those those two strands exist simultaneously, but the big difference is that the more the work that foregrounds narrative has an easier path into bookstores yeah. and libraries, yeah, of course, and some yeah. of that other work you can get, but you have to go to a church basement in Brooklyn on the right day to or, find or it. Or here, yeah, yeah, yeah. I did or see here. some amazing yes. stuff walking mm -hmm. around this morning. Yeah, totally. Or you have to follow the right person on Tumblr yeah. and see when they spot when they announce that they have a hundred copies that you can get right now on PayPal, you know, and that yeah. kind of thing. And actually, um, I mentioned that because I went I went through a little uh, when I which you're probably about to get to, and I went through my more recent difficult patch with comics, um, I was drawn to that work that was non less obsessed with narrative because it was so different to what I had always done. And it f helped to free me from my sense of what comics had to be. Um, and I went on this little journey and then I came back to something that was actually so incredibly kind of focused on narrative. Mm -hmm. So I, I sort of came full circle. Mm -hmm. but, uh, yeah, well, I mean, I'm not act exactly sure which period you're talking about when you say your difficulty, but what I do remember is that um, in 1998, Hicksville was collected, and then, it, you know, a few years later, you started what seemed like it was going to be, like, your next uh, committed project, mm -hmm. Atlas, which over a period of a few years, you published a few issues of, and this was a very interesting serial 
uh, that was sort of connected to some of the ideas in Hicksville without being a proper sequel. Um, and you know, again, this goes back to that question of like artistic crisis or questioning about what to do. Can you talk a little bit about, first of all, starting this and then deciding not to continue it? Because I think that's, especially now there's a real um, value placed on productivity and keeping things going constantly. And I think knowing when to maybe not continue working on something is a virtue that people don't talk about so much. Well, I, I wish I could claim credit for, for that virtue, but in, <laughs> in this case, it just sort of petered out. I, the, um, Atlas was going to be my next big book, you know, after Hicksville. And I started working on it at a time that, that Hicksville was getting a lot of attention and I was starting to get attention in New Zealand from the kind of literary world as well. And I, I went into Atlas, I think, with a, a powerful sense that I needed to produce a new book which was even more, you know, even more substantial, even more of a kind of serious literary masterpiece or something in comics form. And, um, and I still love the story and I, I do want to finish it one day, maybe. Um, but, but I think part of the problem was that um, it's really hard to do a good book when you've got this, when you're sort of looking over your own shoulder saying, you know, is this going to be a great book? Is this, and I mean great with a capital G, is this, is this going to be an important book? Is this a serious masterwork? It, it's really, that's crippling, you know, so I kind of, um, I kept re replanning it and rewriting it and it got more and more tangled up until um, I had like three different books sitting there that couldn't coexist. And uh, it really, I got quite stuck with it. But it also, um, after, around the time that I was starting to work on Atlas, I also got hired by DC to write comics for them. Um, and I, I wrote a fantasy comic called Hunter the Age of Magic for Vertigo for uh, a couple of years, um, drawn by Richard Case, who's a lovely guy, and then I, um, then I wrote Batgirl for a year and a half, and uh, I, I discovered an important thing about myself, which is that um, I just can't write commercial comics. <laughs> <laughs> and I did it for four years, um, and it, it um, dug us out of a debt hole and it, it uh, paid for our dishwasher, which I've always been grateful for. <laughs> my, my kids are really grateful for that. Um, and also it was a good conversation starter at parties in New Zealand where, you know, I would be at a party and people would say, what do you do? And I, I do comics and, um, oh, really? What character do you do? And I was like, yeah, I write Batgirl. And I'm like, oh, really? And they're all really interested. You know, if I said, oh, I do these graphic novels about cartoonists, you know, they're like, their eyes glaze over. But, um, but having said all that, I just, superhero comics have never done it for me. I don't, I don't I've never really connected with them. It's not a fantasy that, that feels like my fantasy. You know, I don't share it. And so I found it very, um, very difficult to do. And uh, by the end of writing Batgirl, I was so burnt out. I was um, finding it difficult to write anything or draw anything. I'd almost lost my faith in stories themselves. I couldn't read novels anymore. I'd get a chapter in and I felt like this is so contrived, none of it's true, you know, they just made this shit up. Um, I couldn't even watch movies unless they were documentaries. And even those, I was so conscious of the contrivances, the deceptions. The and I became obsessed with a quote from Picasso, which is, um, art is a lie that tells the truth. And I kept going back to it and thinking, yeah, I don't know, maybe, maybe art's just a lie. Maybe it's, it's not telling us a deeper truth. Maybe it's actually just selling us a really appealing lie about the world that's so seductive, we feel like it is true. But actually, it's not. You know? I mean, maybe the world is actually completely meaningless. Life is pointless. And there's no shape or pattern to it. Um, and that's it. That's all there is. You know. And I, so I, I was a mess. I was, an unhappy, I was depressed. I was really an unhappy person. Um, and that's part of how Atlas ground to a halt, mm -hmm. is that I was just 
too unhappy with everything, but particularly with art and with stories, to be making them. I didn't trust them anymore. anymore. A friend of mine who'd years before become a born-again Christian for several years and then had lost his faith and had long conversations with me till three in the morning, you know, trying to make sense of it. Uh, I went to, I was having lunch with him and um, I was talking about all this and talking about how I just couldn't read novels and I can't write and I, you know, I don't believe in stories anymore. And he looked at me and said, I know this, this is a crisis of faith. I had one of these. <laughs> and, <laughs> and he was right, it's a crisis of faith. My whole life, stories and art were the closest thing I had to a, to a religion, to a faith, and I'd lost it. I'd lost my belief in it. Mm. And that's what Magic Pen came out of, was yeah. that, that journey. Yeah, and this is, I mean, in a way, this is the same <coughs> Sam Zabel who had, you know, who was kind of at loose ends um, in, in Hicksville. Mm. And then when we re encounter him in the Magic Pen, um, he's, uh, my cursor. Uh, he's very much in the same kind of situation that you describe about yourself. Is it fair to say that the starting point of this is Sam Zabel is a kind of thinly veiled avatar for where you were before you started yeah. drawing this? Fairly thinly veiled. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, except he doesn't. He doesn't have glasses. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> admittedly, I've only had glasses for ten years, but mm -hmm. um, also, you know, his wife looks slightly different. Um, and although they're both their wives are academics, they're academics in different fields. And, uh, <laughs> totally, yeah. Just complete, I don't know why people mistake Sam Zabel for me. Yeah. And, but, um, so yeah, I, I was just, I started this story, I was still doing Atlas, and Atlas was this big serious thing that I had to take, you know, it was very important. Um, but I, I started doing a little backup story in Atlas, which was just, I, I could relax with it, you know, and it grew out of a daydream that I was having while I was writing for DC, which was about a cartoonist who's kind of just put in this position of being like emperor of the world and they can do whatever they like and everyone just wants to give them everything and I thought, well, that would be quite nice, wouldn't it? So I kind of would daydream about that um, and, um, but inevitably I would then worry about the ethics of it and mm. the morality of that. Uh, and so, because the conceit, can you explain what the conceit of the magic well, pen is? Um, I guess it's not really a spoiler because that's emer that emerges part way through the story. Yeah. Um, so the the idea is there is a pen, a magical pen. I know it's my New Zealand accent. How would you guys say pen? Pen. Pen. That's great. Pen. <laughs> so it's a <laughs> not a not a pin. You don't use it when you're sewing. Um, New Zealanders have a, we we tend we. We get sick of vowels, so we just kind of don't say them. So, um, so there's a magical pen, and it's been hand handed. I'm not gonna be able to say that word this whole bloody tour now, am I? It's been handed from artist for, to artist for, for centuries, um, and whatever is drawn with that pen creates a real parallel universe that you can enter if you know how. You need to know the secret of how to enter it, um, which is. Uh, I'll give some of it away. So it's, you have to give it the breath of life. And Sam discovers this when he's sitting on a bus reading an old 1940s New Zealand comic he'd never heard of before. And while he's reading it, he sneezes because he's got a terrible cold. He sneezes and when he opens his eyes, he's inside the comic because um, he just gave it the breath of life. And that, that actually comes from, um, in New Zealand, we have um, a phrase which is from Māori protocol, from Māori ritual, which is tihe Māori ora. If you stand up on the marae in, in New Zealand to speak, you start by saying tihe Māori ora. Tihe means the snee it's the sneeze of life. So tihe is a sneeze, which is a great onomatopoeic word, and Māori ora is like the spirit of life. And it's the, the humans were created by the god Tane who made them out of clay and then sneezed life into them. Um, so that's what Sam does to the comic. And uh, once he's in, all bets are off. Everything changes in the story. And it stops just being a story about a miserable cartoonist who can't draw and becomes a story about our relationship with these fantasy worlds that we make up. Yeah, and he does eventually end up in, among uh, his many adventures in this book, he ends up in a place somewhat like the one you describe, where everyone does want to serve the emperor god he's, cartoonist. He's the god king cartoonist of yeah. Mars. <laughs> Um, and and that's that's when I think the, the, what you were talking about before comes up as like the key question of the book: Are we morally responsible for our fantasies? And the book begins with a paired 
um, epi- is it epigram or epigraph? Epigram. I, you know, epigram. I'm, always, I'm always checking that. I think yes. it's, does anyone know for sure? Epigraph, I think, is what you put on a gravestone. Mm-hmm. And an epi- that's an epitaph. Oh, that's an epitaph, that's right. Oh, From Jesus, the Greek yeah. epitaphio. I'm a terrible um, pedant. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, let's say epigram. It's an epigram. A so paired epigram. Yeah, so I have two. Mm. And, and the reason I wanted to have two... So that what they are, the first one is from the poet Yeats, and he says, in dreams begins responsibility. And the other one is from Nina Hartley, who's a a porn performer, producer, and a very thoughtful writer and speaker about pornography, Nina Hartley. And she says, desire has no morality. Um, And... I wanted to use both of them because I felt like they're, they're directly opposed. The view they're expressing is directly opposed. And yet they're both true. They both seem true to me. And so I wanted to explore the territory between those two positions and try and make sense of it and find my way through it. And to try and understand how both of those things can be true. It's so interesting because I felt like, I felt like this book was... The, the, the themes raised by this book that are, that are highlighted by these two quotations seemed so timely not too long after the book was published. Um, you know, we, through an online community, are, we, I sort of interacted in, in some conversations that also included you around like the time of the Charlie Hebdo uh, massacres in, in France. And there was a lot of debate around that about, you know, is, is an image justified or not justified? Is it wrong? Is it morally wrong or ethically wrong to put an image on paper and publish it that might bother someone? And it seemed like uh, you, you had a lot of thoughtful responses to those questions, but it seemed like in a weird way, kind of, even though that's not what you started out looking to explore, it played into your consideration of those two points of view about the responsibilities of fantasy, the responsibilities of art. It was funny timing for me because um, I'd finished Magic Pen and it had come out. And um, the Magic Pen is exploring that question of our moral, you know, how morally responsible we are for our fantasies and for our art, I guess, for the, the consequences of our art. You know, does our, do our fantasies, do the things we draw, do, do they shape the society we are, we're in and do we need to be mindful of that and cautious about it? And... And I mostly end up exploring that in the book through the question of, of erotic fantasy mm-hmm. um, and the, the kind of ethical responsibilities around that. Do we have responsibilities? To, is, and if so, you know, why and to whom? And maybe, maybe transgression is the point of it and maybe fantasy is all about enabling ourselves to explore the things that we do consider um, to be problematic and so on. You know, but... but but what the Charlie Hebdo raised was another side of that question about the moral responsibility for art. And um, I, mean, I have to say that I found the discussion that, I feel like discussion's almost a polite word for it, but the, the shit fight that happened on, on uh, particularly on social media, but in the, in the wider media as well, and probably in a lot, of, um, a lot of real life people were sitting around arguing about it. Uh, that happened after the Charlie Hebdo shootings in the English-speaking world. I have to stress that I think that discussion mostly happened in the Anglophone world. In France, people knew Charlie Hebdo so well that they, it was a very different conversation. Um, but I feel like the discussion that happened in the Anglophone world was, was mostly based on people really having no idea about what Charlie Hebdo was, who George Walensky was, uh, who any of those cartoonists were, or of their body of work, um, and and I was I was frequently frustrated by the 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 way it, the whole arguments would play out in which both people involved in the argument didn't know what they were talking about. You know, and I it, I found that really hard. And for some people, it was expressed as a virtue to not know. They didn't need to know. They could just look at the images, and immediately know what they needed to know about the image. And, and I felt like that was, I had a lot of problems with that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So especially images that are drawn as political cartoons for a weekly magazine because they're so deeply embedded in the, in the context. Um, 
So I, I found it really a very, but, it, but what happened is that my own relationship with the magic pen as a book changed in the course of that discussion. And I found myself, um, see the magic pen was set up as a, dis, as a conversation with myself about the, the central question of our moral responsibility for our art. I, I, the conversation emerged out of drawing, uh, out of writing Batgirl stories that I felt uneasy about. You know, there were stories that presented the world as a, as a violent jungle full of predators who were pursuing the innocent. You know, the Joker and Penguin and so on, they're just they're these heartless, violent predators. And the only way to, to protect the innocent is for Batman to become better at violence than they are. And, uh, and it, it, when I was writing them, it was, you know, it was at the height of the Iraq war. And um, I remember once getting a, an issue back from DC and it had a recruiting ad for the US Army on the beach. You do a very well chosen slide. Well timed. A recruiting ad for the US Army. And I thought, oh, you know, it just it felt like the whole thing, the comic, the advertisement, everything was all part of the same kind of narrative. They were all presenting the same narrative about the world, that the world is this dangerous place full of predators and human predators and that we need to be tougher than they are, more violent than they are. That's the way to, to overcome them. Um, so so that, that issue around the kind of ethics of, of, of it became so um, urgent for me. Uh, but, but what the Charlie Hebdo massacre and, the, and the, the, the particularly the response to it in the English-speaking world, where so many people felt like, you know, these guys were... The, the real issue was how evil Charlie Hebdo were, right? Because they're terrible racists and Islamophobes. Um, it made very immediate for me the other side of that issue, which is the importance of being able to um, draw freely mm -hmm. and the danger of s not only censorship but self-censorship. Um, and so I spent some time processing that and one of the works that came out of that is this one which was, um, I was asked to do something for a Christchurch art magazine in New Zealand and it was just, you know, here's two pages, do what you like with it. Be, being an art magazine, they call it a page work. Not, you know, <laughs> would you like to draw a comic for us? Would you like to do a page, a work? page work? I don't know if this suits your practice, but... Um, the page is medium. I love it, I love it. So, so I did a page work for them. Um, and what I did is I just, I researched um, cartoonists who have been jailed, beaten, seriously threatened, forced into exile, tortured or killed specifically for drawing their cartoons. And what I found is there are so many. The ones I drew in here, there's 27 in this drawing, which I just called Je Suis. Um, that's just the tip of the iceberg. There's so many. I couldn't, I couldn't, I'd have to do, you know, multiple page works to squeeze them in. Um, and they come from all over the world and from many different cultures and societies, many different political viewpoints, many different faiths or non-faiths. Um, but in every case, it was simply drawing their cartoons that got them into that terrible situation. And it was a reminder that sometimes the stakes are very, very high. And it, it's really important that we, that we don't forget that... Um, that if we start to embrace censorship or to embrace, and not just state censorship, but, but the suppression of people's ability to draw what they want to draw, when we start doing that, all kinds of people, we open it up to, to this. This is what we open it up to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I it's, it put it, it, you know, it sort of added another layer for me of the journey I guess I'd been going on for a few years with the magic pen. Mm -hmm. mm. Do you feel like there's um, a, dis a, dis a distinction between, like for example, what I'm thinking of is there's like a moment in magic pen where um, Sam, uh, he's in this situation where he has a lot, a lot of temptation. And, right. and he's in this fantasy world that feels real but seems like it couldn't be real, but he's also like, wait, I'm married. Uh, you know, and, <laughs> and, um, 
Uh, and what I'm, one of the things I'm wondering is, I, I think one of the one of the problems with the discussion around a lot of this stuff is that it's so blunt. You know, it's either mm. this is you should do this or you should never do this. And um, it, there, in addition to the lack of uh, context that we see in online discourse, there's also kind of um, a, any act of criticism seems to somehow become prescriptive in a way. You know, and I think. I think we can certainly agree that no one should be disallowed from doing uh, anything uh, or drawing anything. Um, is is there a, a, a kind of third position that's, well, it's okay to draw this because we live in a free society, but it's a personal moral failing to draw a certain kind of fantasy or something right. like See, that? Yeah, I, I, I think that's a very, I think that's a third position that's very popular right now. Mm -hmm is that it's a moral failing, failing to mm -hmm. draw this. Um, I don't, personally, I don't, I don't feel comfortable with that position. Mm -hmm. um, I've, I, I, guess, I guess mine is more, um, okay, you've, you know, you've drawn this, let's talk about it. Mm -hmm. you know, I think I, I mean, it's, it's hard to say because when I, when I drew Magic Pen because I didn't know the answer to that question mm -hmm. and I wanted to explore it, and I wanted to um, try and find an answer. And I feel as though by the end of the book, and still to this day, I don't feel like I have an answer now either. But what I do feel is I feel a lot more comfortable living with the question. And I feel like I have a healthier relationship with the question because it's no longer predicated on fear. I feel like my, my, my earlier question was that I was afraid of doing the wrong thing. And I was afraid of producing art that was destructive, unhealthy, it was wrong, you know. Um, and I, I think now I, 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 I'm actually, I'm very interested, I've always been very interested in the fantasies that we produce which are, um, which are uncomfortable, difficult, you know. I, it's, and I, I take this to an extreme. I mean, I'm, I, I'm really interested in Nazi art, you know? It's, it's fascinating, because Nazism is partly just a fantasy, right? I mean, it's a, as an ideology, it's, it's, it's an aesthetic fantasy. Um, you look at the, art, the films of Leni Riefenstahl or, or Nazi photography or, or um, painting, a lot of it's very beautiful, you know? It's very beautiful and it's very, um, there's a kind of lyricism to it. And it, but, it, but it's fetishizing certain things in a way that, that is also connected with the sort of drive to purify, to purify the people and the folk. And, and you know, it's, it's, it's horrible. It's, it's, it's horrible. <laughs> and the, but did Lenny Riefenstahl, you know, should, I, I don't know the answer to the questions of whether she should take moral responsibility for the Holocaust. I don't, I don't know. I, I guess so. You know, I guess that she bears some moral responsibility for it. But should she have not made the art? I don't know. I don't know. Um, but I'm, I'm, it doesn't mean that it's not potentially valuable art in another way. I mean, the whole history of art is, is shaped by social and political forces which are also destructive. You know, we have, we have a long history of colonialist art. Um, I mean, I grew up in a, well, we all did. America is a colonial country too, right? I mean, you, you, you guys grew up on movies about cowboys and Indians. You know, there's a genocide behind that. Just like in New Zealand, our, our whole history of art is partly, in the background of that is that it's a colonized country. The indigenous people lost their land. They lost a lot of their role in in, in the creation of the new country. And um, you can't you can't ignore that. You can't gloss over that. But it also it, I also feel like it's a, that by saying therefore all that art is bad art and we should we should throw it out. I, that, that's also a, a kind of a failure. Well, that's also what the Nazis did. They declared modernist exactly. art degenerate art, exactly. and they got rid of it. It's, yeah, and, 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 and because they wanted to purify. They wanted to purify the culture. And I, I feel like sometimes, with the best of intentions, we succumb now, you know, well-meaning liberals like me, 
find it easy to succumb to the same impulse to purify the culture of things that we consider destructive and toxic. And, and in the process, we lose... I mean, every piece of art can be read in an infinite number of ways, ultimately. And it doesn't mean that, that therefore, everything's OK. You know, we can stop worrying about it. Of course, we still worry about it. But the way to explore it, the way to deal with it is to have a, as, as deep a conversation as we can about it all the time, about all art, you know. But not just a political conversation, a conversation that also includes the pleasure and the joy and the ways in which people use it productively. Um, you know, the most grotesque, horrible horror movies are used by some people to deal with trauma. Uh, the, there are, you know, the, the, the vilest pornography um, which appears incredibly abusive to women, is embraced by a lot of women for all sorts of reasons. You know, there's, there's, everything is so complicated and so nuanced that we do ourselves a huge disservice by trying to boil everything down to a simple position which is right or wrong. And so I feel like ultimately, you know, where I've come to by doing this book is that I just want to keep, I want to keep that territory between those two positions those two extreme positions, I want to keep that territory open. I don't want to have people come in and put up walls and say, no, you know, this side is right and therefore everything on that side is, is unspeakable or, or wrong. I want to keep the territory open and I want to keep the conversation going. And we, we can all continue having that conversation internally as well. And so ultimately, I guess, that's where I came to. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dylan. We're um, out of time, and I'd just like to thank you for being here. I'd like to thank you all for being here today. Please join me in thanking Dylan for being here.